Amen. Well, it is a privilege to be here with you all this morning. Uh, as was mentioned, my wife Elizabeth and our four kids, we currently live in London, England. We spent 10 years in South Asia and India decided they didn't want us anymore. And so we've been in London now for about five years. We've had the privilege of leading the work amongst all European peoples for, for the last two years. Uh, my daughter Sadie, who's five, she's pretty much only known England. She was actually born in India, but she, she's known England, and so she's very much British. And so she'll, she'll come up and be like, Daddy, I need some water, please. <laughs> and so whenever we're back in America, it really confuses people on, uh, on who she is and where she's from. Man, what, what an honor it is to be here this morning, to share a little bit about what God is doing around the world. And I'm here to tell you that God is doing a lot around the world. A lot is changing around the world. The geopolitical scene is, is literally being disrupted even as we speak. From the emergence of China as a global superpower to what is happening in Western culture with its worldview and culture to the immigration and the e-migration, there's so many, so many things happening in the world. The least of which is technology, which has flattened the world significantly in terms of communication. So this means that, that our generation, I'll be 40 next year, so I have one more year of life. I still can count myself young for one more year. Our generation has a significant opportunity to see incredible gospel advance. While we're also going to face incredible challenges uh, along the way. But because of how the world is set up, God has set the platform for our generation to engage the nations like they've never been engaged before. So I want us to spend a few minutes and look at Romans chapter 15 and how Paul summarized the end of his first three journeys. And then I want us to, to take a step back and look at the state of missions in the world today and see some changing trends and how, how we as a generation can engage in what God is doing. So Romans chapter 15, uh, we're gonna be in verses 15 or 14 to, to 23. To set this up, this is again, Paul explaining at the end of his three journeys, he's explaining to the Romans what happened in those three journeys. And he's saying, now I'm setting my eyes on the next place where the gospel has not gone. So we know that Paul, used to be Saul, was radically saved. He was at once an enemy of the gospel, radically saved by Christ, devoted his life to seeing the gospel move forward. We know that in, in Acts 13, as he and Barnabas are in the church at Antioch, the Holy Spirit calls him and Barnabas out and sends them on the three journeys. So they leave from Antioch and they begin on these journeys. Uh, we know that as he's engaging in these journeys, he does the work, as it says in Acts 13. So what is the work? Well, as we see Paul moving throughout these three journeys in the area from Jerusalem to Illyricum, we see him doing six primary things. And this is how we really uh, uh, define missions. The first thing that we see Paul doing is he's always entering new peoples and places. He's entering new places where the gospel either hasn't been or where the gospel has little access. The second thing we see him doing is boldly sharing his faith. He's boldly declaring Jesus Christ as Lord. The, the third thing we, do, we see him doing is discipling new believers. So he's, he's always entering new peoples and places. He's always sharing the gospel broadly. He's always making disciples. And then we see him also making sure that there are biblically faithful churches that are left behind. Because Paul understood that while he was there for a season and he was going to move on, it was critical that the church was there to be the sustainable presence of the kingdom in that local place. Then we also see him raising up leaders. There were some leaders that ended up coming with him, Aquila and Priscilla, Timothy and Titus, uh, Apollos. But we also see that he leaves some leaders behind as he comes back to appoint elders or he sends Titus and Timothy back to put in order the work that had begun. So he's entering new peoples and places. He's sharing the gospel boldly. He's making disciples. He's seeing churches formed. He's raising up leaders. And then the sixth one is exit. He exits and he entrusts the work through the Holy Spirit to the local leaders. So as we see, as we, as we see Paul go through his journeys, these are things that we see him constantly doing. 
And so Paul did not just have a view on evangelism, although evangelism was critical, but Paul had a view of the whole missionary task. And it's really important as we move forward in the world that we're engaging that we look holistically at the whole missionary task. So that, that's what we see Paul doing through these journeys. Now we get to Romans 15, where again, he's unpacking this time for the church in Rome. So it says, my brothers, I myself am convinced about you that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of God's good news. My purpose is that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus regarding what pertains to God. For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. By the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. As a result, I have fully proclaimed the good news about the Messiah from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. My aim is to evangelize where Christ has not been named, so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. But, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. That is why I have been prevented many times from coming to you. But now I I no longer have any work to do in these provinces, and I have strongly desired for many years to come to you whenever I travel to Spain. For I hope to see you when I pass through, and be assisted by you for my journey there, once I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Now, this is a, an incredible statement that Paul makes. And we see towards the end that, that Paul says, there's no longer any room for me to work in these regions. My job here is done. What an incredible statement for Paul to make. So, so how can Paul make a statement like this? Well, first, let's, let's think about the scope that he's talking about, right? So he, he mentions from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Now, where modern-day Jerusalem and, and Illyricum are, Illyricum would be around the Albania area of Europe, is about probably 300,000 square miles. We know that in the time that Paul lived, there was most likely 20 to 25 million people that lived in that area. So Paul's saying that the work of the gospel has been finished in this 25 million people place. We also know that Paul's journeys, the three, the three journeys, were about 12 to 15 years. So in the space of 12 to 15 years, amongst 25 million people, Paul could say, my job here is done, and now I am going on to Spain, to the next place where the gospel has not been proclaimed. So we see that Paul's heart here is to take the gospel where the gospel has not been. We see that, that Paul, as a minister of Christ Jesus, understands that it is not his work, but is Christ accomplishing the work through him. So as, as we look at, at this passage, I want us to zoom out just a little bit and, and think about the world and what it would look like for our generation to say, there's no room left for the gospel, even in the nations because of how the world is set up today. Now this is a passage, Romans 15 is a passage that God used in my wife and I's heart as he called us out to go to the nations. Uh, We studied at Southwest Baptist University. Uh, I was studying biology pre-med and pretty quickly uh, the Lord let me see through some test scores that probably pre-med was not the way that I was going to go. And so uh, as I was praying through what what was next and what the Lord had for us, and the Lord really brought missions and the nations to my heart. My grandparents had adopted some Vietnamese when the, back in in the Vietnam War, when Vietnam fell, a bunch of Vietnamese refugees came this way. My grandparents had adopted some, some Vietnamese. So I had Vietnamese cousins. I grew up with Vietnamese culture. And the Lord used some of that in my heart to, to open my eyes even just to a world outside of America which when I was younger, I didn't even think about the world outside of of America. As we were at SBU and really praying through this, God laid Romans 15 on our heart, that there were literally people in the world that had never heard the name of Jesus. So I spent six months actually in Vietnam. It was in Vietnam that I learned that that's actually a very true statement, 
There are literally millions and millions and millions of people in the world who have never heard the name of Jesus. So this is the passage, Romans 15, that, that God used to look at India as we looked at 1.3 billion people, many of whom had never heard the name of Jesus. And so my wife and I packed up our bags and our daughter Sky at the time was uh, eight months old and we headed over to India. When we got to India, uh, we began to see God do some amazing things. I remember one young, young man that I talked to and, uh, and asked him if he had ever heard of Jesus. And he said, what's a Jesus? Are you kidding me? What's a Jesus? Man, I had taken so much for granted the access that we have to Jesus in this nation. For 10 years, we got to see God do amazing things through uh, the Islamic community coming to Christ from radical uh, Islamic backgrounds from Hindu sadhu priests coming to Christ from a younger generation that's emerging in India with a radically different worldview as they have access to social media. Uh, we began to look at global cities like Mumbai with 25 million people and how to see the church multiply through a global city. And then one day, all of a sudden, India came and said, you cannot be in our country anymore. And it threw our whole world into a tailspin. Because this is where God had called us. This is where we were supposed to be. This is the ends of the earth that we're taking the gospel to. So my family and I, we, we end up in Bangkok, Thailand. And as we are in Bangkok, Thailand, we're just praying through next steps. Uh, what, what the Lord would have for us next. And our, our organization came and asked if we would uh, move to London, England. And we thought, London, England? That's the last place we would go. Because Europe... Europe has the gospel. Europe knows Jesus. So no, we're not going to go to, to London, England. But the Lord kept reminding us and reminding us and reminding us. And as I began to pray and dig into the statistics of London, England, as I began to look at the rest of Europe, I began to realize that there is a huge need for the gospel in this continent of Europe. And so my wife and I, five years ago then, moved to London, England. So as, as we've dug into the, the statistics of Europe, uh, there's several other organizations that we work uh, hand in hand with. Europe is a very hard place to do statistics with Christianity because of its history. Uh, just because it has Baptist on the door doesn't mean that it's biblically faithful by any means. Uh, you have Western Europe, which tends to be more liberal in its approach, and you have Eastern Europe, which uh, tends to be much more legalistic in its approach. You have Orthodox, you have Catholic, you have Anglican, you have Lutheran in the in background, but today, not in reality. Many of them have never cracked the book, uh, have, have ever cracked the pages of the Bible. So we, we began to work together to figure out what, what are the statistics in Europe. So working together, getting down to the church level, uh, the best that we could come up with Europe today, which would, which would be from Russia all the way over to the UK, Canada and Australia, would be 1.1% evangelical. So Europe today, by as best as we can tell, is 1.1% evangelical. 810 million people. Guys, that means that Europe is the most lost continent on the face of the earth in terms of percentage of evangelicals. How staggering to even say that. Three weeks ago, I was in the country of Ukraine, where I met several Ukrainians in a village uh, out, by, out by Russia, actually, that, that had never heard the name of Jesus. We speak to young Brits frequently in the young professional world of Google and Facebook and YouTube who have heard of this concept of Jesus, but they've never, they've never read the Bible. They've never even heard of what Jesus came and did for them on the cross. 810 million people, 1.1% evangelical. Yet at the same time, what is happening in Europe is the nations have merged on this one continent. Every nation under earth is in Europe. So you have incredible lostness and you have massive diversity where people are there from hard to reach places like Syria and Saudi Arabia. So what begins to emerge is, is Europe is the most strategic place for global gospel advance today. We currently have access to share the gospel and where people can take the gospel back to really hard places that Americans can't even get into. And you have a European population that desperately 
needs Jesus. So this began to open my eyes to some, some different things that God is doing in the world today than he, than he was 50 years ago. So I want you guys to see this slide of the global status of evangelical Christianity. Now this is the most recent update that we have uh, for the global status of evangelical Christianity. This is something the International Mission Board puts together alongside many other uh, organizations uh, that we work with. So you can see different colors here. The, the green represents reached peoples. The, the ye yellow, uh, orange, and red represents unreached peoples. The red would be some of the most unreached peoples in the world. There's a couple things about this map that, that really pop out. The first one that I want us to look at is China. So if you, if you remember in geography class where China is, it will be on the right side of your screen and look at all the green. Praise God. In 1970, there was a conference in Switzerland called Luzon. And when Luzon happened in 1970, that green was dark, dark red. Very little gospel access, very little happening. And actually, most Westerners weren't even allowed to be in China. Over 50 years, God has worked in incredible ways in China to where now there are, there are some estimates of 7 to 8% of Chinese would claim Christ. Now, 7 to 8% of 1.3 billion people is a lot of people, which means that what has happened over the last 50 years is the emergence of the global church. The mission does not just belong to the West anymore. And these, these Chinese, these Koreans, these Filipinos, these Brazilians, these Africans, they're like, hey, we have the same commission in the Bible that you do. We want to join hand in hand and arm in arm and let's create a global force to see lostness engaged to the ends of the earth. So looking at China and then looking up at Europe, which used to be all green in 1970s, is now yellows, oranges, and reds with a few scatterings of green. So the global landscape has shifted significantly in terms of where the church is. There are, great, there are a lot of estimates that uh, the church in the global south, the majority world, uh, which would be Africa, Middle East, Asia, and then South America, make up 75% of the church's population. Whereas the west, the global north, would only make up 25%. So the next 50 years, it's going to take a very diversified workforce to see the nations engaged. The next slide that I want you to see is a slide of the unengaged, unreached people groups. So you'll see that, that these are dark red. Now these are people groups that represent about 270 million people around the world. Currently, there is no one, no one that is taking the gospel to them actively. They have no one that is praying for them that is, well, they have a lot of people that are praying for them. They have no one that is taking the gospel to them. So you can see where they're scattered. But I want you to look, uh, if you can see, near in Oklahoma. So this is another thing that has changed. We used to think about unengaged, unreached people groups, these peoples that have never heard the name of Jesus, as over there. But because of immigration and emigration uh, issues over the last 20 years, they're now here. I'm aware of about 1,500 uh, Afghani refugees that will be landing in Oklahoma in the next couple weeks. God is bringing the unengaged peoples here to our shores for us to engage with them. So we see the rise of the global church. We see the diminishing role of America on the global stage, uh, which is challenging for us to hear, but it is, it is true. As China emerges, countries are beginning to align with, with China as, as an international mission board. We've seen challenges in countries we haven't had challenges in before, where these countries used to look at Americans in a very positive light, they're now, uh, they, they now don't look at us in as much of a positive light, and it becomes challenging for us to get access. However, other countries, like the Chinese, have total open access to a country like Pakistan. And so this is shifting our role in how we look at this. Uh, the, other, the other great challenge that's arising is immigration and transients. Uh, again, it, it's hard to, to state the amount of immigration that's taken place over the last 30 years, and literally population shifting. Uh, Western Europe over the last 40 years has become incredibly more diverse to where a city like Frankfurt, Germany, is no longer majority German. 
It's a minority German and a majority of other peoples. Uh, We're beginning to see a migration from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. So God is mixing the nations together, which, which comes with its own challenges, but also incredible opportunities. And we also see economic opportunities in closed countries. We're seeing the Middle East that is opening to business. We see a country like India that's opening to business. China has been open to business for a while. So historically, uh, they would have been incredibly grateful for people from the West or people to come in and do social good, like start schools and and help with, with community projects. They're not as open to those things anymore. And so one of the best ways for us to access some of these countries currently is actually through business. And so if, if you are studying business, if you are uh, studying in the medical field, the Middle East has tons of medical opportunities for you to go be a doctor or nurse overseas and engage uh, those peoples with the gospel. So we begin to, to see the changing dynamics of the world. And then we begin to see technology flattening the world. And what we begin to see is a picture emerge that our generation has an incredible opportunity to engage the nations like we have, have not seen before in history. In the year 1800, the population of the world was just over a billion people. This is the year 2021, and there is about seven and a half billion people in the world. So that means over the last 220 years, the world has increased in population by about six 6.4, 6.3 billion people. Most of that population growth has happened in a place where the gospel is not in the global south. The, the scale at which we're experiencing these problems in the world, corona being a great example, is a scale at which we've never experienced in human history before. Just because of the, the population. It means that God is going to have to do a work on a scale that we've never seen in history before. And I believe that God is calling out our generation. I believe that he is setting before us a challenge. We know from Romans, we see that that Paul says that Christ is the one that did this work. He said, Christ has accomplished through me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of God's spirit. As a result, I fully proclaim the good news about the Messiah from Jerusalem all the way around to, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. My aim is to evangelize where Christ has not been named. So God is setting the stage. And I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is doing. I know that you guys are walking through uh, go trips. And as, as Corona begins to Um, hopefully begin to move aside. I know that in Europe, nations are opening up more and more where we can travel. Uh, East, Southeast Asia is still pretty closed. Africa is still pretty closed. But as countries begin to open up, uh, I can tell you from traveling in in several of these places over the last couple months, the need is incredible. The economic impact is, is incredibly devastating. The poor are only getting poorer. The amount of immigration that this is going to cause is is at a scale that, again, we just haven't seen before. The need for the love of Jesus is huge. And so these go trips that you guys are signing up for would be an incredible opportunity for you to go and engage the nations. We also have opportunities at the International Mission Board that we would love to, to speak more with you about. Uh, We have summer trips where you can come and spend six weeks on a team overseas. We have uh, hands-on opportunities where you can come and spend a semester abroad, six months uh, to a year. And we have Journeyman, and Journeyman is uh, a program where you can come and spend two years uh, after college graduation on a team overseas engaging the nations. And Jacob uh, will be in the Geiger Center after this uh, to speak with you. If you have more questions about this, I'll be down here. Uh, as well. And I know Ben and Sherry Booz are also around campus and would be happy to, uh, to, to talk with you more about how you can engage uh, the nations through the International Mission Board. 
So what is God asking of you? What is the future? We don't know what the future holds, to be honest. And anybody that says they do doesn't know what they're talking about. But we do know the one who holds the future. One of my favorite passages in scripture is Psalms 2. As the nations rage and they take counsel against God and against his people, they're seeking to divide, to divide them. Seems like the enemy's being fairly successful today, unfortunately. However, as all of these powerful people take their sights against the Lord, he is on his throne and it says that he's laughing. He's holding them in derision. Because he set his king on Zion, his holy hill. It's Christ. And he says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. And so the first thing that I want us to do, and I feel like is really critical for us to do, is really to pray. Because God knows what the future holds. What is the future of America? We can pontificate about that for weeks, but nobody knows. But God knows. What is the the future of the world. God knows. So let's sit before his throne asking and petitioning him. And I believe that he will begin to open up doors for our generation to see gospel impact like we haven't seen before. The reality is that Jesus came and he died on a cross for the sins of the nations. He rose again the third day defeating death. And this world greatly needs Jesus. I'll close with, with, uh, with this. In London, England, over the last year and a half of corona, we've seen a significant challenge with mental health issues. Uh, one of our close friends who is not a believer um, committed suicide. And there are these seemingly wealthy individuals who are totally broken inside. A lot of these young Brits that we speak to, they say things like, I was told that education was the solution to all the answers of the world, and there's more problems today than ever before. I was told that wealth and money were the, were the answers to all the problems that we were seeking. We have more money and more wealth than ever before, and we have greater problems. I was told this was the solution and that was the solution, I can't find the solution. All I know is I feel terrible inside and I am broken. And they're searching. And we have the opportunity to frequently go and pray for them and say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'd love to pray for you. I believe that he loves you. He cares for you. Is there anything that we can pray for you about? And there was uh, one young guy who uh, I asked this question to and he just began to, to cry. A young British guy who was devastated from sin in his life. He was devastated from the way that his parents, uh, some of the actions that his parents had taken. He was devastated by an action that someone had taken against him. As we were able to pray and ask Jesus to to work on his heart, to show him the love. He, He looked up and he said, will you share with me more about Jesus? Because I've never, I've, I've wanted to know more, but I just, I've never really had the time to dig in. And honestly, I've never met anybody who could share with me about Jesus. So I shared with him how Jesus loves him. Jesus came and he died on a cross so that he could take his sin. That he no longer would have to bear the wrath of God if he trusted in Jesus because Jesus took the very wrath of God for him. That he no longer had to fear death. That he no longer had to fear brokenness because he had a hope of a glorious future as we get to heaven where there are no more tears, no more sadness. And as I was sharing this, you could tell that the Spirit was working on his heart in in deep conviction. And as he received Jesus, he also received healing and was whole again. And there are countless stories and countless people like that around the world who just need to hear the love of Jesus. So if the Lord is calling you out this morning, please go talk to Jacob, uh, talk to the boozes. I'll be up here afterwards and and we would love to help you find where the Lord would have you uh, serve on mission for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these students. Thank you for a generation 
Lord, thank you for these new things that you're doing in the world. While it brings incredible challenges, we also see great opportunity for the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would call out many from OBU to continue to engage the nations. Thank you for the many you have already called out from OBU uh, who have engaged in China specifically, in Tibet. Uh, Lord, for the work that you've accomplished there through students and, and the effects that OBU has had. Lord, I just pray that you'd multiply that many times over in the years to come. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.